Chronic pelvic pain in men can be a distressing condition and is one in which affects millions of men. Today we are speaking with a board-certified urologist who is an expert when it comes to helping those individuals suffering from pelvic pain. Listen in to learn more. The show today is brought to you by your sponsor, the Prostate Health Academy. The Prostate Health Academy is launching soon, and this is exciting news. The Academy will be an essential community for individuals wanting to learn more about prostate conditions, connect with like-minded individuals, and improve their overall health. So the big question is this, how can men and those who care for them better educate themselves regarding prostate health, the conditions that affect the prostate, and the latest technology in managing these conditions? That is the question, and this podcast will provide the answers. On a weekly basis, we'll be chatting with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field of urology, sharing useful information with the general public to improve their lives and increase their overall health. My name is Dr. Garrett Pullman, and welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Prostate Health Podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as medical advice. By listening to the podcast, no physician-patient relationship has been formed. For more information and counseling, you must contact your personal physician or urologist with questions about your unique situation. It is certainly a pleasure to have joining us today on the podcast, Dr. Nell Gehrig. She is a board-certified urologist currently practicing in the Mile High City of Denver, Colorado. She graduated from the UCLA School of Medicine and completed her urology residency at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in Denver. She has since been in the private practice of urology, and her passion is the treatment of pelvic pain disorders. We'll be learning more about her approach today on the podcast, which is interdisciplinary, involving physical therapists and many other medical specialists in the care of those suffering from various aspects of the pelvic pain syndrome. Dr. Gehrig is the founder and medical director of the Pelvic Solutions Network, a group of providers working together to help those with pelvic pain. When she is not helping individuals with pelvic pain, she enjoys spending her time with her family and their Australian shepherd. And you can also find her keeping busy with gardening, skiing, and helping with homework. Dr. Gehrig, welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Well, I really appreciate you joining us on the show today. A little backstory for our listeners. During my time in urology residency training at the University of Colorado, I was fortunate to have been able to spend some time shadowing Dr. Gehrig in her practice, and I really learned a lot from her. In fact, to this day, I still find myself referring back to the notes I had taken and clinical pearls I received received with her at that time. Um, That's awesome. So what motivated you to really follow the path you've taken to get where you are today and really become an expert and leader in the field when it comes to pelvic pain? So I did have uh, classical training in urology, and as soon as I finished my residency, women with interstitial cystitis started to find me, and I didn't know how to take care of them. They wanted to see a female physician. That's why women started coming in first, and I had to learn more about it, so I took every class, webinar, training session that I possibly could on the subject and became a bit of a self-taught expert as well as learning from my patients. And then the more I learned about the bladder disease, interstitial cystitis, the more I learned that there's often musculoskeletal or neuromuscular involvement with this disease. And I started working more with physical therapists who taught me even more. And then finally, I learned that sometimes the neuromuscular component involves a condition called pudendal neuralgia. And so I had to take classes about that. And it's a pathway that happens as you go along. You learn a little more. You become more interested. You get better at what you do. Then you have more questions. You want to learn more. You get better. And it kind of just got off on that path until gradually I came to the point where I focused my entire career on the treatment of pelvic pain. And I say I've come full circle because although I started out because women came to see me. Now, I'm a huge advocate for men with pelvic pain because I think they're more under-recognized and under-treated than women, and it's not that great for women either. Well, that's uh, excellent, and, you know, I would really congratulate you to, you know, kind of going, you know, the extra mile to learn, you know, more even after training and uh, continuing to uh, really be an advocate and, uh, you know, for your patients. So, and for today, I wanted to really focus in on male pelvic pain. And for our listeners, could you explain what is the chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome? 
typically in my lectures, I say that the term chronic pelvic pain is not a diagnosis. It's an admission of ignorance, (laughs) which is a bit of a bold statement, and I'm not trying to put anybody down, but I think that it's a term that's used that just indicates how little we understand about what's going on. And I would say that the three things that I treat the most and which all can be related to each other are the things I just mentioned, interstitial cystitis. And I would list that separately from chronic pelvic pain syndrome because I think people are getting a much better idea about how to diagnose and treat interstitial cystitis. However, many patients who have that, 95% of them also have pelvic floor muscle tension. So the second thing I treat is muscle tension in the abdomen, low abdomen, glutes, thighs, and the pelvic girdle and pelvic floor, which is sort of the outside and the inside of the pelvis. And there are a variety of different ways and pathways in which men can get muscle tension. And when muscles are tight, they push on nerves that are within or next to the muscles. And that can be nerves that are big enough to have a name such as the pudendal nerve, which is very important in pelvic pain, or it can be just the little tiny branches of branches of nerves that are within the muscles. So those are the three things are the primary diagnoses that I treat, and most patients fall into some of those diagnoses. So what are some of the common symptoms you see in men with this condition? There's usually pain. Pain is definitely the thing that brings people to see me. The pain can be in the genital region, penis, scrotum. It can be in the perineum, which is between the scrotum and the anus. It can be in the rectum. People can have pain at what we call the sits bones, you know, the bones you sit on when you're on a bicycle seat. People can have pain with urination, pain with bowel movements, pain with ejaculation, pain with sitting, pain with movement, other postures, and sometimes urinary frequency or a sense of not being able to empty the bladder adequately. And the same can be true for the bowel. There can be difficulty having bowel movements or sense of incomplete emptying or urinary or fecal urgency, that feeling that you just don't have enough time to get to the bathroom. So when a patient presents to you with some of these symptoms, uh, what does your typical evaluation involve when sorting out what is going on with them? The most important thing is the history, which means what does a patient tell you about their symptoms? And then I have developed what I call a pelvic pain review of systems to ask patients questions that they might not, about things that they might not have realized could be related to their symptoms. And so that's probably 90% of the evaluation, just talking about what they experience day to day. But it's very important to confirm that with physical examination. And one thing that many people don't understand is that a physical examination by me or by a physical therapist or by another person who's trained in this area can have far more value than the most sophisticated MRI. Because what I can feel in your muscles and your tissues I can feel significant abnormalities that might look perfectly normal on an ultrasound, a CAT scan, an MRI, and patients get frustrated. They say, no one can find anything wrong with me. But physical exam is very important, and it's also very important to confirm what you're thinking. Sometimes I think I know what the diagnosis is after I've spent that time getting the whole story, and then my physical exam leads me to something else. So I would say, you know, 95% of the evaluation is those two things, hearing the story, doing a physical exam. Often other testing is not needed other than maybe simple things like a urinalysis and what we call post-void residual, which is a little ultrasound scan of the bladder to see how well the bladder is emptying. Well, thank you for that. And And I know our listeners will be anxious to hear your treatment strategies, but before we get into that, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back. There's some exciting news coming with the Prostate Health Academy. The launch is just around the corner, where we'll be opening the doors to the Academy. This will be an essential community for individuals wanting to dive in even deeper and learn more about the various technologies available to them for prostate conditions. In the Academy, you will be able to interact with like-minded individuals in the private community forum and have access to exclusive bonus podcast after hours video content with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field. 
We'll also be keeping up with the latest evidence on a prostate healthy diet and exercise and creating a roadmap for you to keep you on track. For those that don't want to miss out, you can sign up for the wait list at www.prostatehealthacademy.com. And chronic pelvic pain syndrome can often be a difficult one for urologists uh, when it comes to treatment. Would you mind sharing you know, with us your treatment strategies for individuals you see suffering from this condition? Sure. I think the most important thing is to be able to, to make the diagnosis in the first place yeah. of what's really causing the problem. So there's a treatment algorithm for interstitial cystitis that's fairly well outlined. There are certain medications and supplements that can be used. If people have visible lesions of inflammation in the bladder, they need to be cauterized or injected with steroid. And that's the typical pathway for interstitial cystitis. For muscle tension, the and neurological issues, I say we have goals and we fit our plan into those goals. Goal number one is to optimize alignment because some people have pelvic malalignment. For example, if they have scoliosis, if your lumbar spine is tilted, your pelvis is going to be tilted a little bit either. So also, so obviously one side will get more stretch and tension and one side will be looser and that can cause problems. The second goal is to reduce muscle tension. And I tell every patient that little phrase sounds so simple and it's not. (laughs) Muscles that are tight are stubborn. Well, I'm sure we can all think of areas we have in our body where we tend to have more muscle tension. I carry my tension in my upper back and shoulders. Some people carry their tension in their pelvis. And then there are other physiological factors that can contribute to degrees of muscle tension. So for muscle tension, the primary treatment, again, is physical therapy. I do use a lot of muscle relaxants and I encourage things like adequate fluid intake because hydration is very important for muscles and fascia that are tight. They not only do they need to get to relax, but they need to be able to move through the entire range of motion and they have to be hydrated. They have to have fluid within them to be able to do that. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I also recommend magnesium supplementation for anyone with muscle tension. Our muscles can't relax if we don't have enough magnesium, and it turns out we're all a little low because our soil and food sources have changed. It's completely safe to take magnesium unless you have kidney failure or kidney disease. Otherwise, you can't take too much. And then finally, we treat nerve pain or what I would better call neurological upregulation And I'd like to explain that a little bit. If you have had pain for more than a few months, your pain nerves start to change the way they function. And unlike your brain that learns to tune out white noise so you don't even hear your kids crying anymore, your pain nerves do the opposite. They become more and more sensitive. They pay more and more attention. It takes less and less of the same stimulus to now produce a sensation of pain or discomfort. And eventually they go on autopilot like there's a pacemaker in the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerves. And they start sending pain messages even when they're not being stimulated. That's neurological upregulation. And everyone who's had any kind of pain for more than a few months has some degree of that. And so I think it's an important issue to address for every person, but how we address it depends on the severity of their pain and for how long they've had the pain. And I say we reduce neurological upregulation with neuromodulation. And there are many things that are neuromodulators. Heat and ice are neuromodulating. Physical therapy is neuromodulating. One of the best neuromodulators is mindfulness meditation and deep relaxation, things like yoga. There are medications that are neuromodulators, and those fall into the category of medicines that are either antidepressants or anti-seizure medicines. And then there are technical gadgety things that are neuromodulators like a TENS unit and the ultimate neuromodulator would be a neurostimulator which is a device that's implanted in the body to deliver low-level electrical stimulation to nerves. Well this has certainly been an excellent review and really appreciate you kind of going through that and now kind of in conclusion Dr. Garrick any final thoughts today for our listeners? Uh, There's another major contributing factor that can be a contributing factor to pain, and that is a history of trauma. And that trauma can be anything such as having had verbal abuse in childhood or parents who had 
substance abuse or psychiatric issues to severe motor vehicle accidents and other, you know, not just any physical or mental, any kind of trauma can be a factor that contributes to ongoing pain and needs to be addressed in order for people to feel better. Well, it has really been a pleasure today getting to connect with you again, and I commend you again for your dedication in helping both men and women with their pelvic pain issues. You've really delivered some valuable information today that will help empower our listeners, and we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you again for listening to the Prostate Health Podcast. We would love to have you join our podcast Facebook group at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash prostate health podcast or just use the Facebook group search function and search for the prostate health podcast and ask to join. We'll see you at the next episode.